encourage you to go ahead and get them open. Colossians chapter 2. And then you're going to be in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. And then you're going to be in 2 Chronicles 16. Colossians 2, you may just want to write them down. You know where to go. Colossians 2, 2 Kings 5, 2 Chronicles 16. Choir and orchestra, thank you so much. As you always do, you bless us by focusing our attention on the Lord. How many of you here today know that He is our fountain? He is our mighty warrior. He's the rock of ages. He is our prince of peace. He's the living water. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. Jesus Christ is everything. And by the way, He's the only thing. Matter of fact, He's not even a thing. He's the person. He's the great high priest of God. And He hung upon a cross and shed His blood so that we might be saved. And we come here today to exalt and magnify the name of Jesus. Today's... uh, message title is learning to see the truth but it's not so much a sermon title as it is really explaining what we're going to try to do today today we're going to try to learn to see the truth and i know i'm not the only man in the building have you ever had a hard time taking new testament truth and finding out how that matches up with old testament or maybe you're in the old testament and you say well how does this reconcile itself to the new testament well, today, what I would like to do is take second, uh, or in Colossians chapter 2, we're going to open up to me a very simple New Testament idea. It's a very, very important uh, teaching in the Word of God about what Christians should focus on. But then we're going to drop back to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at two examples. And that's really how the Old Testament in our day so many times is meant to be used. There's two times in the New Testament it says all these things that come before were written for our example. So that means that every time you find a truth in the New Testament, you can always go back in the Old Testament and find a truth in somebody's life that exemplifies that. So that's where we're headed this morning. This morning, we're going to try to learn how to see the truth, no matter where we are in the Word of God. If you have your Bible open to Colossians 2, we will be reading verses 6 through 8. Colossians 2 verse 6 says this, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. May we pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We ask that Your Holy Spirit would just... Uh, invade our hearts and minds. Father, we pray that we're open to the ministry of the Spirit of the living God, that He is the only one that can teach us this Word truly. And so I ask, dear God, that You would teach us by Your Spirit what this means and strengthen us in the inner man by the power of Your Spirit. For we ask it in Your name. Amen. And you may just want to start, and I found this, I found all Christians to be quite a good bunch of liars. In many, in many, many cases. But one is that we'll read the Bible and say, okay, I read my Bible. But we really don't know what we mean. We we don't even know what we just read. I would dare somebody, not to be ugly, but how many people could truly say, hey, when the Bible says you receive Jesus Christ, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, see that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirit spirits of the world, and not according to Christ, I read my Bible into the story. How many people right now could just stand up and say, I know exactly what that's talking about. I know what God wants me to do right there. See, it starts with a, one of the greatest ways you'll ever learn the Bible is as you read the Bible, first of all, you don't lie to yourself and you don't say, I know what I just read. Most of the time, and you, you, this may surprise you, most of the time when I read the Bible, when I get through reading a text, to be honest, the first thing I have to say is, I don't know what I just read. And then, if you don't know what you read, you, one of the greatest things you could ever do is go to the author of the book. Because the author is the only one that really knows what he meant when he wrote the book. So who's the author of the book? Spirit of God. 
And the Bible says that the Spirit of God has come to me as a believer to live in me. But you know what? I have a little verse I keep right here in my Bible, and it just happens to say, The Lord teaches the humble His way. You know the reason most people can't learn the Bible? They're not willing to admit they don't know what they just read. The first way to read the Bible is to open up the Word of God, read it, and, and be honest with yourself and say, God, I want to obey your Word. I want to know what this says, but I'm not real sure about what you just said. And guess what? Here's the beautiful part. If you say, Lord, teach me, and you're serious, guess what? He'll teach you. And that's what this is talking about. When you come to the Word of God, and I just want to walk through this first part briefly because it's going to be the springboard for the rest of the text and the rest of the morning. All it is saying is that when we come and we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, when you receive Christ, then, and this is on and on through all the other New Testament letters, all say the same thing. Once you become a Christian, the way you continue in your Christian life is you just continue to walk in Jesus. Oh, well, that sounds too simple, and we're going to get into that this morning. And so what do you do? You're rooted. What, is, what do roots do? They go down and they... Hold on tight, right? I mean, what's the purpose of roots? I mean, nutrition and, and holding down, grabbing. And then it says, so you're rooted in who? Not all kind of other stuff. You become rooted in Jesus. And then as a Christian, it also says, the other thing you do in Jesus is you get built up. So you go deep, you get strong, you get nutrients, and then you build up. But it's all in Jesus. And it says that says how you become established in the faith. You become rooted and built up. In Jesus. All of these are simple terms that we can understand. And then it goes on to say, and here's the thing. Most people don't know that as you're coming to church, as you're trying to be rooted, as you're trying to be grounded, as you're trying to be built up in Jesus Christ, guess what? Believe it or not, there's opposition. Do you know many times we often say, uh, well, America, years ago, our military leaders and different people, they would say, you know what, if, if somebody gets America, it won't be from the outside, it'll be from the inside. Okay, what do we see happening in our nation today? A tearing down from the inside. Can I just give you a real quick uh, example of that's the only way it's going to happen in the church? Do you know what's happening in the church? It's not an outside job, brothers and sisters. It's an inside job. It's an inside job. That's what this scripture is talking about. Once you know who Jesus is, you just stay focused on Jesus. But here's what the world comes in, and this is what the world offers the church. The world will walk right into the church and says, oh, well, that's cool. Now, do it our way. And that's what this is talking about. He says, you be careful that no one takes you captive by the philosophy, the empty deceit, according to human tradition. What? The way the world works. See, the Bible teaches that this world has a system. This world has a way of doing things. God has his way of doing things. It's miraculous. It's by faith. It's trusting in him. But the world's got the way of doing things where they receive the glory and look what I can do and look what I can measure. And it's just the world's way of doing things. But the church and the Christian is always at a severe risk of trying to do God's things man's way. Matter of fact, it is actually taught all across churches today, it's okay. You know their, their catchphrase? Oh, no, no, we didn't change the message. We just changed the method. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, God's got a method that you better not touch. Amen. It's His way. And so the Bible says, now you're a Christian. Grow up in Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Stay on Jesus. And if anybody comes along with any little song and dance in the church that, that actually would take your eyes off of Jesus and put it on man's way of doing things, the Bible says mark it and walk away from it. So how are we going to see this in the, New, in the Old Testament? If you will, take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, we're going to take the New Testament example of not being confused by human tradition, by the way of man, just focusing on Jesus. We're going to jump back into the Old Testament, and we're going to see how this truth comes alive in the Old Testament. So hopefully it will also teach you how to go back and forth between the Old and New Testament, and there won't be as much confusion. Acting like one does not correspond to the other. 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 14, I'm going to read the text in its entirety. Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. 
Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of leprosy. So Naaman went and told his lord. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will, take, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends me to cure a man of leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, much better than the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child, and he was clean. Now, in the New Testament, we're plainly taught that Jesus is the only way. He's the way we begin, He's the way we stay, and He is the way we finish. This does not sit well with human tradition, which says we have to, we've got to do something that puts our name on the list with Jesus. Christians are always in danger of being captivated by human tradition. So, what can we learn from Naaman on this? First of all, if you look in verse 1... It says Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man, and he had favor with his master, that he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now, leprosy in the Old Testament is always a picture of sin. Now, I don't have time to get into that, but, but, but there's some marvelous teachings. If you know how to unwind the book of Leviticus, it is, it is an absolute... The Bible teaches that leprosy in the Old Testament is a picture of sin, what it does, and how it will be cured. So when you see old Naban, I want you to understand, you need to understand that when we come to this world, the Bible says we are all sinners. We are all need to be saved. That's how we can start to connect the dots between the truth in the Old Testament and the truth in the New Testament. So we have this picture, and God gave us this picture of Naban to make us see how not to get caught up in human tradition, but how to learn to trust and accept the Word of God as we're supposed to teach teach it and accept it. So Naaman's position, power, and prestige could not buy his cleansing. Notice that he's a great man. Many people in this world, they're trying to climb the ladder, do this, do that, do this, do that. But he was a leper. But we are sinners, and I don't care if you're the president of whatever nation. I don't care if you're the president of whatever company. I don't care how many millions you have or don't have. When we come before God, our sinful condition, we're just like lepers. So, in the world, remember, human tradition says power and prestige can rise you up above this. The Word of God does not teach that. The Word of God says you need Christ. You need the simplicity of Christ. It is Christ alone. So, it's in the world, one of the first things we learn is that your power and position and prestige will not save you. Notice this, men of great power, the king of Syria and Israel could not buy his cleansing. The king of Syria Syria sent uh, to the king of Israel a lot of money to try to get his cleansing. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends me word to me to cure a man's leprosy? Let me just say this. The world can't save you. That's the biblical teaching. 
And then, so the Bible's like, the only way you can be saved is by Jesus. So the only way you can continue to walk as a Christian is with Jesus. But what happens is you can get saved, and then you can be easily confused, like most churches are, are walking back out into the world and doing things the world's way. Oh, if we do this, and if we do this, if we do this. You know what people need in this world? A Savior. Amen. They need a Savior. They need to be saved by Jesus Christ. The things of this world cannot save a man. Okay, and the, the sooner Christians get real crystal clear on this, the more progress we'll make. It's good to feed people. It's good, to, and we do all these things, and they're awesome. But if you forget the primary job is to, of the church is to tell people about Jesus Christ, we've missed the point. People can go to hell hungry, or people can go to hell full, but only Jesus saves men from hell. And so we've got to be clear on what we're here for. The truth of salvation has been entrusted to those who know God, not the world's intellects or powers. The message began with a little servant girl. <laughs> this man found out how to be saved from a little girl that had come from Israel. Matter of fact, she was taken actually as a slave in a raid. So here you have a little slave girl that is serving as a servant. But let me tell you something. The Bible says in the New Testament that God has so decided... That the, by the foolishness of preaching, that men will be saved. See, the world don't want to hear this mess. That's not the way the world operates. That's why the Bible is very plain. Once you've come to Jesus, you better stay in Jesus. Because there's a million ways this world will try to rip your heart and mind away from Christ. And the Bible says, guard that. When Willie came over here this morning and he prayed, he's praying for you. He's praying that God would move. And he looked around and he said, do you know how many hurts and how many problems are in a building like this? Do you know how many people are distracted from Christ and Christ could save you right now? Christ is your answer right now. But the world will give you all these false answers. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, listen, don't be deceived into following the world's way. The world will swear it has all the answers and it has none of the answers. So salvation cannot be bought even at a great price. Notice what he sent. He sent 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Money cannot change your standing with God. You cannot buy your salvation. You can't buy your way out from under the sin you're under. God offers it as a free gift by hanging his son on the cross. And we're going to continue to get into how that operates and how man does not want to accept that. But let me tell you something, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, it doesn't matter in the eyes of God. Right. Men seek after money, and it's okay if you got money. Money's not evil, money's neutral. Okay? If you don't have a lot of money, it don't mean you can't be used by God. If you have a lot of money, it don't mean you're in favor with God. Money's just a neutral object, it's all according to how you use it. But they send it over there, and they're like, here, let, let me give you all this money. And the king of Israel... It's tearing his clothes. Who am I? I'm not God. That's right. <laughs> the world can't save you. It don't matter. Who, it, what does the world try to convince you to do? Oh, if you do this and you make this much money and you have this kind of position, you have this kind of prestige, and you have this kind of this, you'll be all important in the eyes of the world. And you'll be just like Laman. It said he was this and he was this and he was this, but he was a leper. And you'll have this credential and that credential and this kind of money and this kind of... Thing and that kind of thing that the world says, oh, look at this fella. But the end of the story in God's eyes will be, but he was not saved. So salvation cannot be bought. God's ways require humility and obedience. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. The worldly way says there should be more to it. The worldly way wants a little religion. The worldly way wants to add a little something to what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. you telling me all I got to do to be saved is go over there. In the, in the example of Naaman, you're telling me all I got to do is be cleansed from this horrible, deadly disease. That makes me an outcast to society. Makes me not fit to, to, to be around people. That's going to kill me. That's going to ruin me. It's going to eat my... That's what sin does. It's going to eat you from the inside out. 
and leave you dead. That's why leprosy is a picture. It gets on you and it begins to eat you away. And sin gets in the human heart. And sin, look in the world today. For all our education, we went to the moon, we got all these medical... Are men getting better? Is mankind getting better? You know why? We want to throw out the first part of the book of the Bible. Genesis. We want to act like, that's not real. When God said, I created man for my glory... In my image, and Satan came in and tempted them and turned them, and sin came into the human heart. And if you want to know why the world is the way it is and why your life is the way it is, it's because Satan has come in to the world to kill, steal, and destroy. And there's one strong Redeemer. There's one that come from the portals of heaven. There's one that was sent by God the Father. And it's the only one. His name is Jesus. He had been foretold by the people of Israel, the promise of God for thousands and thousands of years. He is mine. He will come. And He came and He hung upon a cross. And men don't want to receive Him because they will not bow their knee to a bloody man on a bloody cross that's willing to die and save them because it insults their pride. Men want their traditions. Men wants religion. Men wants to show you, look what I can do for God. God is saying, look what I did for you. Now humble yourself and receive it. Here comes Naaman, what can I do? You can just go dip in that old muddy river and be saved. I don't want to do that. God's way of, is offensive to the pride of man. It says Naaman was angry and he went away. I would like to remind the church that the gospel is still offensive. The cross is still offensive. The blood of Jesus Christ is still offensive. And some people will be saved by it. And some people will be offended by it. But the church needs to stand as the light of truth and not back down. Amen. The world, the church is taking on the philosophy and the empty deceit of the world. The world says, I don't want to hear that kind of Christian talk. Okay, we'll dumb it down for you. I don't want to hear about the blood of Jesus. Okay, we'll dumb it down for you. I'd rather be entertained than preached to. Okay, we'll dumb it down for you. And y'all have heard me say this before. You got it right, brother. We've dumbed it down, and now we got a dumb church. I don't back up off of it. I'm telling you, I'll give you a Bible test if you think you're smart. We've dumbed it down so much. We don't even know what we believe anymore. Again, being defeated from the inside out. How? This verse in Colossians tells you how. You're not sticking with Christ and you're falling for the ways of the world. And you have appearance of a church, but you're lacking the motivational power that only comes from a group of people that magnify Jesus alone. Man has his traditions. He said, this is what Naaman said, Behold, I thought they would surely come out to me and stand and call my, upon the name of the Lord, his God. Are not Abana, this is two rivers in uh, Damascus, and far apart, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? See, this is, the, this is the Old Testament picture of what it's talked about in the New Testament. Don't be deceived by the philosophies of men. They come out, they tell the man the truth. You want to be saved? This is how to be saved. Ah, I didn't the way I thought it was going to work. Don't matter. Don't matter about what you thought it was going to work. If you had, if you had it figured out, boss, you'd done be fixed by now. You want me to tell you why I know the world don't have it figured out? They ain't got it fixed by now. You say, how come Christianity ain't got it fixed by now? People ain't trying it. That's why. They're not obeying it. Ah, I don't believe in that stuff. Okay, that's fine. But it ain't going to work until you believe it. It's by faith you were saved. You've got to put your trust in it. So, man and his traditions. I want to say just a few things about this verse, and I want you to, I hope you've been paying attention already, but I pray you'll turn up your extra attention, whatever you got, and think about what I'm fixing to say to you. Man's ideas on how religion should work. That's what he's really describing. Hey, it ought to be like this. Notice there was two rivers, Abana and Farpar. 
the man of God says, just go over here in the Jordan River. Get down in that river seven times. You'll be okay. He said, oh, no. I'd rather have Abana and Farpar. I'd rather have the rivers in my land. They're better. They're cleaner. They're better than that. I want you to think about this. If you learn how to compare truth, the truth of the New Testament, that is truth that will never change, the truth of the Old Testament, the truth that will never change, and don't go, get lost in the stories and fairy tales. And if you'll learn how to look at truth, that's what I said. The whole point of this message is the title. Learn to see truth. Let me learn how to see truth when it's right there on the page. Learn how to see what you're reading. Learn how to understand what you're reading. Learn what you're looking at. Learn what God's trying to say to you. Do you know why places, things like Jehovah Witness and Mormons pop up? Let's go down and find a river like Abana and Farpar. Let's do away with this uh, just Jesus stuff and let's add some of our works to it. We don't like it like that, so let's invent our own. Do you know there's a lot of modern, called evangelical churches? It shouldn't be New Beginnings Church outside the door. It should be called the Church of Abana. It should be the, called the Church of Farpar. In other words, we don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it man's way. We want to put God's name on it, and we want God to validate it, but we don't want to do it God's way. We want it, that's, what, that's what Naaman was doing. Okay, uh, a river, I'll go dip in a river. I'll get religion. I'll do kind of what you say to kind of look what God said, but I don't want to do it exactly your way. I don't want to completely humble myself. I don't want to completely give myself over to Christ. I don't want to absolutely obey Christ. I want to still keep my pride about me. I want to come to Jesus, but I still want to look like glorified in the world's eyes. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to start my own little place over here in Abana. And a lot of churches ought to change their name to this because it's just men making churches that suit their self. There will always be a desire in mankind not to do things God's way. Why? Go back to the book, the book of Genesis because the devil's out there and he's trying to tempt you to do wrong. You'll fight it till the day you die. Notice something else. Why is this? He says, all this is better than the waters of who? Better than the waters of who? I don't think anybody can hear you. Better than the waters of who? Where did the Messiah come from? Jesus Christ was promised through Abraham. Here comes the Jewish lineage, and Jesus Christ is a Jewish. Salvation is of the Jews, and it goes out to the Gentiles. You know what man's religion says? I'll have anything other than that Jewish Messiah. You have you ever thought about this? Almost the whole world hates the Jews. You ever ask yourself a real serious question, why does the world hate the Jews? How's the world going to come to a Jewish Messiah when the world hates the Jews? You thought it was over oil? Get real, man. The devil ain't interested in oil. The devil is interested in people going to hell. That's learning the philosophy of men and not being focused on Christ. And for generations now in America, we're focused on the things of men. Amen. And we've needed to get focused on the things of Christ. We're thinking like the world thinks. The world doesn't want anything to do with Israel because the Messiah that would save the world come out of Israel. And if God can have you hate the Jews, you won't be looking to a Jewish Messiah to save you. Because you already have a stumbling block before you saying, I hate Jews, I'm not listening to anything about a Jewish Messiah. When we obey God, we're saved. So he went down and dipped himself Seven times in the Jordan. Notice this. According to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of the child. And he was clean. God's way of salvation is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people are like Naaman and are being held captive through human reasoning. This way offends our pride. This way is easy. This way doesn't glorify or include me. You just must be willing to humble yourself to obey and receive it. Look very closely at verse 13. This is where the church needs to stand today for the world. 
Remember, Naaman heard it. It didn't fit with his human philosophy of what ought to happen. He was like, wait a minute. He didn't even come out here and see me. All he did is tell me the truth of what needed to happen. He should have come out here and raised up his hand and put on a big show, had some big religious event, and said, hey, buddy, your leprosy's healed. The prophet's like, no, it ain't going to be like that. You just need to go obey. You just need to go get in the Jordan and dip, and you'll be okay. But notice, Naaman would have went away broken and lost and doomed in his leprosy had it not been for this man. This is where the church needs to be today in verse 13. Now the servant of Naaman, after Naaman had already got mad, after Naaman had already walked away, his servant came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word. I don't know what that does to you, but that lights me up. You know what I have today for the world? A great word. The world is ridiculing me because I am a Christian, because I believe in a promise of a son of God that would come and die for mankind, that he would hang on a cross, that 2,000 years ago the Savior of the world died on a cross and rose out of the grave, and that you can have eternal salvation and your sins forgiven, and you can go to heaven by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world ridicules for me because that don't fit their plan, that don't fit their motive, that don't fit their religion, that don't stroke their pride, that they don't want to humble themselves and accept that and just simply believe God. they rather have their way of getting to heaven and it won't work. And I'm here to tell you this church never, ever, ever needs to stop standing before the world when the world rejects Jesus like Naaman rejected the truth and we need to be standing there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know you want to turn and go to hell. I know you want to turn and die. I know there's pride in your life. I know there's deceit in your life. I know you don't really know the truth. But wait a minute. Please listen to me. Wait a minute. Is this not a great word? I don't believe it for this. I don't believe it for that. I don't believe it for this. Just stop them and say, is this not a great word? That God would give His Son to die for your sins and hang on a cross so that you can be saved and that all you have to do is let go of your pride and humble yourself and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why are you turning away? Why are you so angry? Why are you so mad? Why are you trying to philosophize your way out of salvation? Why don't we just stop the world right now and say, Hey, buddy, is this not a great word from God? Will you not do it? Will you not wash and be clean? Will you not do it? Will you not be saved? Do you want it man's way or God's way? God's sending us out to beg men and women to say, this is the word of God. Will you not do it? It's a great word. Will you not be saved? That's our job. It's not our job to believe it for them, and it sure isn't our job to change the message when they reject it. Will you not do it? Can I say to you that this has got the word of salvation is a great word. Are you too proud to receive it? God let his son die on a cross for our sins. Will you not wash and be clean in the blood of the Lamb? Leprosy in the Old Testament was a terrible disease, and it represents that what sin is in the life of every person. Naaman didn't want to dip in that dirty river, and many don't want to come to a Savior that had to die on an old rugged cross. But let me ask you one more time. Will you not wash and be clean? I had a whole other example, but I think that'll suffice. You say, well, man, it sounds like you might have been talking to somebody that don't know the Lord. I pray I am. More than that, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God is talking to your heart. That you would come to Christ and be saved. But do not think for one second that I'm not talking to those of us who know the Lord. And let, let us bring ourselves before we close right back to the main text of Colossians 
which reminds us as Christians, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit and according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Brothers and sisters, let me warn every one of us, myself included, looking in the mirror, that there is a devil out there and he wants to take the power out of the church and he wants to take the power out of the church by taking the focus off Jesus. And it's a subtle, dangerous trap, and many churches are falling into it, and they're not lifting up Christ with boldness and proclaiming Jesus Christ and Him alone. They're not walking with Christ on a daily basis. They brought human tradition and philosophy into their life, and this is what the Apostle Paul says about that. It is empty deceit. So if you don't know the Lord, we're fixing to have a hymn invitation. I'd ask that we'd all stand at this time. Our men are going to come down.